or still are waived. Um, and the RSGB helpfully produced these uh, videos, uh, which if you haven't seen them, I, I thoroughly recommend them, um, which take you through what you would have done as a, a practical and um, it showed you how to SWR a, a dipole and how to use an ATU and all, all the things that we, uh, we used to do with our foundation students. Um, big question, unknown answer, will they come back when the pandemic releases? I hope they do. Other people say that they're glad they're not around and uh, uh, some see them as a barrier to people coming into the hobby. My experience of running courses in the last few months is that uh, people are missing out and, and the, you know, the, the, we had a guy asking us, what's all this SWR rubbish? Um, and uh, that worried me greatly because he, the fact he hadn't done a, a, an antenna tuning thing, he just had no appreciation of what it was all about. Um, so... Yeah, I, the jury's still out. We'll see. Um, hopefully, we'll uh, we'll get to know something as the pandemic things are relaxed. Turning to the exams themselves, um, again, not surprisingly, we've got three. You want another tea, Pat? Could you mute your microphone, Howard? Thank you. Uh, um, we've got three exams: foundation, intermediate, and full. Um, not a massive difference from where they were before in terms of timings and numbers of questions, slight adjustments. Some have got a few less. Uh, intermediate's got uh, uh, an extra question. Uh, the same pass rates apply, I think, to, to what they were before. Um, so I uh, forget the exact numbers, but you, you, you can work it out from the percentage how many questions you have to get right to, uh, to pass. Because it's fresh in my mind from what we've been doing, it's 35 out of 58 for the full. And we've been, uh, we've been going through a number of those recently. Um, there are three reference booklets. Um, for those who took the exam many moons ago, uh, you, you had to remember all the license schedules and, and all of that. Each level now gets some degree of help in terms of reference material. Um, some of it is license extracts. Some of it is band plans and... Uh, the, there's a, a maths formula sheet, so you don't have to remember um, the, uh, the, 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 the formula. You just need to be able to apply them when you get a question. Um, so they've all been updated and uh, jolly useful they are too. Um, I do get frustrated when students don't look at them uh, because particularly at the full, most of the license questions, the answer is in front of you. You just have to find it in the license and with a bit of practice, that shouldn't be difficult. It's amazing the number of people who fail the exam by two marks and you find they got three lookup questions wrong. Really frustrating that, especially for the student. Um, there are also some mock exams online. Um, they look pretty much like you would get any, any exam. That's a, a copy there on the, uh, on the slide of one of them. Uh, it's a full exam uh, paper. Multiple choice, four answers. And um, uh, on the last page, if you can... Uh, prevent people from peeking, there's the answers. One of the problems we've got with those is that there are, there, they have errors in them. Um, some of the answers are wrong, and there's an, a separate document with explanations about the answers, and some of those are wrong. And uh, I know um, Alan Betts and Co are working on that. It, it's slightly disappointing that those were reported in May, and we still haven't seen the new versions. And uh, I keep getting people contacting me saying, I don't understand why I've got question 22 wrong. And the answer is, well, you didn't. It's just that the papers are wrong. And so if it's the night before an exam, that can cause lots of angst for some people. So let's have a bit of a history lesson. Excuse me for a slurp for a moment. How did we get to where we are today? Um, I was minded of that. Was it talking heads? You may find yourself in a shotgun shack. You may ask yourself, how did I get here? Well, this, this is not a shotgun shack, but a radio shack, perhaps. Um, so how did we get here? The first exams were in 1946, believe it or not. Um, prior to that, um, there was a bit of a skirmish going on that uh, prevented radio doing very much at all. But before 1946, there was no exams. You had to just apply for a license and give the, uh, the, the some justification as to why you wanted a license, and, uh, and, and you got one. Um, after 1946, um, some ex 
servicemen got licenses without doing the exam, um, but most people had to uh, sit the radio amateurs examination. And it was set by the post office in those days. Um, youngsters today will not, not understand why the post office was doing this, but they had the monopoly of all communications and telephones and all that sort of stuff. So they were the, uh, the radio people. Um, the original RE had eight questions, just eight questions, but they were essay questions. So uh, um, people go, it's, well, you, know, you couldn't test very much in eight questions, but if you've got to write an essay about it or draw a circuit and describe it, whatever that was, um, that was quite a, a, a test. It carried on in that guise for a while, then the City and Guilds took over in 1961, and uh, not really changing the format very much. Um, I think it moved then to you had to answer eight questions from 10. So there's a little bit of an option of picking the, playing to your strengths, I suppose. Um, but that continued again until 1979, when probably the biggest change uh, for, uh, of all came about when the move from essay questions went to multiple choice. And uh, very controversial at the time, um, uh, but that was the way that things were going. And I have to say, across the world, I think that's the, the most popular uh, exam in every country. Uh, doing the multi-choice uh, is, is sort of the, the favoured way of doing things. But for the Falklands, we just go and buy a licence from the post office. Um, at that time, there were two papers, two separate papers, and you had to pass both in order to get your licence. Um, I won't go into the Morse stuff then because that's nothing to do with the syllabus, but it, uh, that, that you had to pass the Morse to get an HF ticket. Again, that soldiered on for some time. 1991, the novice RE appeared. Again, City and Guilds introduced that. It took a long, long time to get that off the ground. Um, I hadn't realised how long until I did some research and uh, there were references to it way back in the 1980s. Uh, and it, it just took a long time to, uh, to get off the ground. Um, it wasn't particularly successful because you had to do a lot of work and you ended up with three watts on 70 centimetres um, and uh, not many people did that. You could do a Morse test and get a, a, a three watts on HF and I think in the decade or so that it was running about 200 people did that so it really wasn't very successful. 1999 there was another change, um, the two papers were crunched into one um, the rationale for that was everybody passed the license paper, so there didn't seem much point in having two papers. Uh, and I think they reduced the number of questions at that point. I think when I sat it, it was 120 questions, 80 and 40, if I remember rightly. Uh, but it, it dropped into one paper, 80 questions. Um, and it went through another couple of iterations where they changed the syllabus a bit, but it stayed in the same format. 2001, City and Guilds decided they didn't want to play anymore. Uh, there was a plan to introduce the foundation license, and um, one story is that they didn't like the foundation license and the way it was going to be run. When I show you the graph uh, in another slide, you'll perhaps realise why City and Guilds really pulled out. Because um, they, they didn't do the foundation, and they announced that they were going to pull out of the RAE and the novice RAE. 2002, Radio Communications Agency, who we now know as Ofcom, they took on the role of the exam body. Uh, so they became City and Guilds in effect, uh, and, but they contracted the RSGB to do the admin. So they were actually producing the papers, sending them out, recording the results. Uh, the RA were the owners of the syllabus, if you like. Work was then done to integrate the foundation into the other uh, qualifications and streamlined it into a single progressive system. So the, the, the old RE syllabus was broken into three parts and you had to do foundation, intermediate, advanced. The three together were the same as the old REE, uh, but it, it gave you this staged um, approach, which uh, I'd say it was extremely successful. And again, you'll see that short. 2007, the, the charitable body that I worked for, the RCF, were given the role as the exam body. Um, Ofcom wanted to step back. Um, the RCF took on that role. The RSGB continued to do the admin. And the idea was there was a separation of duties between the syllabus owners and the sort of admin role. It was a bit artificial because all the members of the RSCF were members of the RSGB. So it wasn't really a massive separation, but it, it looked good. 
Um, 2013 was when somebody put a flag up and said, I think we need to have another look at this syllabus. It, it had been around there for what, over 10 years. Uh, Ofcom were very worried that too many people were passing the intermediate. The pass rate at that point was about 90, 92%, something like that. And Ofcom thought it was it was too easy to pass for the privileges that were being dished out, you know, 50 watt license and so on. Um, the standards committee said they were worried that not enough people were progressing up to the top level. Um, so that, that something needed to be done. And there was a general perception that the steps were uneven. Uh, the view was it was dead easy to get the foundation, it was dead easy to get intermediate, it was really difficult to get the full. Not a view I subscribe to, but that's the feeling and that's sort of where we were. Um, 2015, Ofcom decided they really didn't want to play this at all. Um, uh, 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 they, they wanted the RCF to, to give up this thing. They, I think they'd recognised that this separation was a bit artificial. So the RSGB were given the job lock, stock and barrel, exam body, admin, the whole shebang. 2017, so four years after the need for the syllabus review was sort of formally identified, um, the review ended with a consultation exercise and the new syllabus version one or whatever it was of, of the syllabus we've got now was circulated and people were asked for their opinions on it. Nothing much happened for a while. And then in 2018, it suddenly appeared as being complete, agreed, and it was going to start from 2019. So there's a year's notice given of the change over. And that caused some really bitter divides uh, over the changes. There were, there were things in there that people were really not happy about. And uh, the, the results of the consultation exercise have never been published. Um, so a lot of people saw that as a bit of a stitch up and um, a, a pointless exercise. We took the view, we are where we are, no point screaming about it, um, we've got to move on. Um, 2019, we, we started looking at the syllabus because we'd still been training under the old syllabus uh, and the Bath team and others uh, provided sort of critique reviews asked questions about this new syllabus because there were sort of contradictions in it. There were, there were things that were duplicated. There were things that we just didn't understand. Um, and then gradually the, these were dealt with. And in 2020, last July, version 1.4 was published, which mopped up a lot of those things. A lot of the, uh, the, the real bloomers were, were wiped out. Um, but that's not to say it's without its problems. It's, there are still issues with version 1.4 but that's what we're working on today, uh, and that's where we are. Now, I've just had a flag that there are people in the waiting room, so if you don't mind, I'll stop sharing and let them in. All right, so, and then we'll go back to sharing. Steve, can you try making me co-host again? I've just changed something on the, on the account, which might... Oh, right. Um, um, no, it just says make host. Oh, maybe you've got to start the meeting again. All right, don't worry. Sorry. Oops. Right, so that's what we're up to. Right, this is the graph that I was going, I was referring to earlier about um, looking at how things have changed from a numbers point of view and how successful changes have been or not. So, this is the number of passes in the exams, not the number of candidates, but the number of passes from 1946 to 2019. Um, and, you know, there's a very obvious um, blip in the middle. <laughs> um, and some would say, you know, that that kicked off here. Um, let me pick up a uh, pointer that, uh, that can do that. Yeah. So at this point here um, is where the multi-choice exam started. And there's a lot of people said, oh, well, you've just made it really easy. So lots of people got involved. But if you look at the time frame for that blip, this was, you know, when CB was at its height. Um, it was actually fashionable to be a radio geek. You know, there were songs in the charts about convoys and, and, and all that. So radio suddenly became trendy. And um, you know, for the first time in a very long time, we, we you know, the, the, the hobby enjoyed a, 
a massive increase. And, and to go from you know below two thousand uh, a year up to or eight and a half thousand, you know, absolutely unprecedented growth. Um, and a lot of people see this as you know, the, the heyday of, uh, of amateur radio. And, and you know, in terms of numbers, it was. City and guilds were, were having to put on extra sittings to get everybody in. Um, but up to that point, you know, it had been a fairly steady um, sort of increase in numbers, but you know, quite flat at that point. And I guess that's maybe why they made the change, because of things had plateaued. But after the trendy CB days, what happened then? Well, look at this massive decrease. Um, and I, I don't think it's controversial to say if it hadn't been for CB, that line would probably have just carried on straight through. Um, I, I think that is you know, the, the fashionable end of, of things. And I, I mean, amongst that, I'll, I, I've got no problems with admitting that. But if anybody's to analyse those statistics, something odd happened in around the night, early 80s and, and CB was it as far as I can see. But if you look at this point here in 2000, when we were starting to look at the foundation license, you can really understand why city and guilds were not that keen on taking on something. This was dying on its backside, quite frankly. You know, as a business, you've gone from having 8,000 candidates plus a year down to a few hundred. And any business in the world is going to question, are we going to invest time and effort in, in, in making changes? Well, you're not really, are you? Um, so that's really, I think, the, the City and Guild's exit uh, strategy was to, to get out uh, before they, uh, it became a, a real loss-making uh, uh, loss effort, if it hadn't already done so. And then this bit here is when we've got the three tiers. Um, so instantly the foundation took off like a rocket, up to sort of 2,000 candidates a year. It sort of died off a little bit, but it's jogging along at about 1,500 a year. Uh, what's Invisible on that graph are the air cadets. Around about 2015, I think it was, they started doing their own exams. And, and there's a fairly level uh, thing there where the, that gap is where the, the air cadets were doing their own thing. Um, and the other interesting thing to see about this, you know, the, you could say that that curve coming down here has just carried on for the full license anyway. And, uh, and that's where it would have naturally fallen if City and Guilds had carried on. We'll never know because you can't unpick history. But what we have got is all the people above that line who perhaps would never have joined in radio at all. So all those foundation license holders, all those intermediate license holders who have not yet converted to full, you know, they can keep in Martin Lynch and Moonraker and Radio World and, and the RSG bookstall and all these people in in clients all this time and uh, keeping the hobby alive and, and vibrant. So as far as I'm concerned, you know, that's been a massive success. Um, and I think it, it, you know, we've got potential there to grow new people. If we hadn't got those people involved, well, you know, we, we'd have been playing around with a few hundred folk, I think, and we, how much already would look very different today. And that's as much as I want to say about that one at the moment. Um, So how different is that 2019 syllabus that we've now find ourselves sort of picking up from that graph where it ended? Well, when the syllabus was published, the RSGB mantra was that the new syllabus was not really significantly different. It still had three levels. Yes, there have been some new topics added, things like digital signals and SDR. Uh, and some of the old topics have been removed, things like valves. Um, so, you know, uh, it was all sort of pretty much for muchness. Some topics have been moved between levels to, to even out those steps that we talked about. Uh, but it, you know, in the round, there was no major changes and, and people shouldn't get too worried about it. I haven't put it on the slide, but I wanted to say balderdash. <laughs> From a training perspective, um, the change was massive. Um, it, it, and I say, at, at one point, I was, I was so disheartened that uh, I was gonna throw in the towel. Right? It was just too big a job to unpick uh, 10 years of work for foundation intermediate and full, and then have to put it back together just seemed like too big a job. And I can fully understand many tutors retired. A lot of them were getting on a bit, I have to say, but um, they took the opportunity to say, I'm hanging up the boots. Uh, and many clubs therefore stopped training because I know you probably recognize the, the, the story that there's always one person in every club who does everything. And if they stop doing what they're doing, 
you know, they, everybody looks around to see who else is going to take over and, and there's nobody there. So uh, I think there was, there's quite a vacuum uh, in, in the, the training world. Uh, and, and hence, I think, the growth of distance learning. Um, it took us a full year to take our material apart and put it back together. Uh, and Mike's on the call tonight, Lewis uh, and, and Mike and I, we had weekly meetings. We all went away and did stuff and uh, it, it was it was hard work um, because as you dug into it, you found it wasn't just a case of, oh, that, that question doesn't fit there anymore. It, it fits over here. You find that half the question didn't fit because not all the material had been shifted. So you had to rewrite the questions or rewrite the notes. And yeah, it, it was hard work, no question about it. Um, but we got there. So it took a while, but we got there. Let's have a look at the foundation first. Excuse me. Um, not surprisingly, where did the material move from? Well, it came from intermediate and advanced, believe it or not. Some of the stuff went from the top level to the bottom level. Um, lots more technical material appeared. Um, there, there's a definite ramping up in the, uh, the technical end of the, uh, the, the syllabus. Um, and there's a higher maths requirement. But if, you, if you remember, anybody's seen the old foundation, you know, there was sort of, you know, maybe 0 0.1 times 0 0.5 or something like that, there's milliamps and, and, and so on. Um, and you certainly didn't do anything less than milli or bigger than uh, the than, than mega in terms of megahertz and things like that. But now you, you go from micro to giga and you have to deal with scientific numbers from 10 to the minus three to 10 to the nine. So that's a very sea change in foundation level. There are new topics about digital signals and about SDR, digitization, uh, which is new. And the change in the practicals, uh, the Morse is now an option where you used to have to do a Morse assessment. You can now do a digital QSO, if you wish, as an alternative. Um, there's a requirement to match one antenna on two bands. So using a, a, an ATU to, to get the match, but not really tuning the antenna, if you know what I mean. Uh, and I think that's a great move. Um, that's, a, that's a good practical thing that people will do. Uh, the requirement to do HF and VHF QSOs has been replaced by SSB and FM QSOs. So you can do the whole thing on two meters now if you want, or 10 meters for that matter. It depends what equipment you've got. There's no requirement to have HF and VHF. All of that put together, we've rejigged our training program, resulted in a 50% increase in training time. We used to run the course over six weeks, two hours a week. Uh, the plan now runs for nine weeks to cover the extra material. So, uh, and I know from others who used to do uh, sort of Saturday weekend courses, they've had to add extra days in to, to do that. So it's, it's not peculiar to what we've been doing. These are the things that are new or have been moved. And I haven't done everything. I've just grabbed a sort of sample to give you an idea of what's in there now. Um, the red stuff is um, uh, the, the new stuff. So digital signals, sampling, processing, analog to digital converters, digital to analog converters, SDR block functions, all of that is all new, uh, not just the foundation, but to the whole syllabus. And then the stuff that's been moved from other areas, um, voltage and current in series and parallel circuits, battery stuff, um, sideband generation, radiation patterns, um, why a foundation license holder needs to know the height of the ionosphere, I'm not sure, but it's in there now. Um, using the dummy load for EMC detective work. Again, not sure that's relevant to foundation, but it's in there. Uh, it's good that they, they need to know that satellites exist uh, and that they mustn't use those frequencies. Um, and, and bizarrely, although you're not allowed to homebrew, or there's not much homebrew anyway involved in foundation, you have to know about soldering, working at height, drilling, and stuff like that. Um, and as we're all going to have to get used to, RF exposures and ICNERP is in there now. So, you know, the, the stuff that we knew about but was dealt with at other levels has been brought in uh, and new stuff. So, yes, the, there wasn't a lot of new material, but there was a lot of material in there that wasn't in the foundation before. And just before I do that, I see there's two more people in the waiting room. Bring them in.
Uh, let's move on to intermediate. Yeah. Um, similar story to the foundation, to be honest. Um, material moved from advanced. Not much, if anything, came up from foundation, as you'd expect. It all came down from advanced. Massive ramp up in technical material. Anybody that's uh, that's done the uh, uh, the new intermediate or, or, or looked at the new intermediate book, who passed the previous intermediate, probably won't recognise big chunks of it because it wasn't there before. Again, there's a higher maths requirement. You know, need to go from pico pico to giga, uh, and you need to be dealing with scientific numbers from ten to the minus twelve to ten to the twelve. So. Uh, uh, and do calculations with those numbers. So it's, it's not just a case of knowing that 10 to the minus six is uh, uh, is micro. You, you actually need to use those numbers and, and do some calculation. Uh, again, new digital topics, new SDR topics, uh, building on what was in the foundation. Um, one of the problems with the intermediate is some topics move from advanced, but not the whole topic. So you're going to get half a story at intermediate, and then you get the rest of it at the full level though. Um, and that's where we found problems with questions that didn't fit in either level. We had to sort of rejig them. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, all the practical assessments have been removed. There's no requirement to do any soldering or plug fitting or anything like that. Um, for us, when we reworked it, it added 40% training time. We used to do 10 weeks of two hour sessions. We now need to do 14 weeks uh, of two hour sessions to, uh, to cover the, the ground. Uh, and that means and there's no practical included in that. That's uh, that's sort of homework, if you like. Uh, the question, uh, sorry, the exam structure changed. There were three questions added in um, to reflect the extra material. So um, I haven't got a, a, a detailed breakdown on that, but uh, it, it, there was a shift, as you can imagine, towards the technical because there's more technical material. Again, a sample of the changes. Um, the blue moved from advanced. The red is the new stuff. Um, it, so if you did the old intermediate, you wouldn't have done capacitors in series and parallel, uh, unequal resistors, um, uh, reactance curves, Q factor, all of that is brand new. The gain in the bipolar transistor, Halfway full wave rectifiers, switch more power supply. Actually, actually, that should be new. That's not new. That was new. A um, whole bunch of stuff there key clips and chirp, um, front to back ratios, 3D radiation patterns, all, all, all of that. And the new stuff, so not surprisingly, mainly about digital, um, but there's this odd one about RF flowing in a long wire. Um, there's a lot of teaching goes into that to get to a point where it proves that RF can go in both directions at the same time in the same bit of wire. Somebody asked me, why do we need to know that? And I couldn't give them an honest answer other than it's in the syllabus. And you might get a question on it. So um, I'm not sure how practical that is, but it's, it's in there. Um, another bizarre one, intermediate license holders are not allowed to use the five megahertz band, but they're gonna ask questions on the five megahertz band plan in the exam. Um, so it's quite tricky to explain to someone why they need to know the band plan or be able to read it when they're not allowed to use it. So not quite sure where that came from, but it, that's where we are and, and that's what we teach. Up to the top level, full license. Um, that's changing right now, it's changing the name. Uh, I'm still getting people asking to come on the advanced exam course. Well, there isn't an advanced exam anymore now, it's a full exam. Um, which lines up with the full license. So that's, that's quite useful. Um, obviously, material that's been moved out of this into the intermediate, into the foundation, um, it is, means it's, it's slightly slimmer, but new material has been brought in. Um, so it's not as much slimmer as you might expect. Um, there are the new digital topics, SDR and all of that in some considerable detail, but uh, we found we needed 18% less training time. So we used to do 17 weeks at two, two hours a week. We now do 14. So it's, it has come down. Um, over all the three levels, we're having to spend more time delivering training to get the uh, message across. Um, whether that will change over time, I don't know, but that's where we are. The full exam has changed, I think, more than either of the other two. Um, 
it's reduced the number of questions and people go, hurrah, that makes it easier. Well, it actually makes it harder because you're asking fewer questions about the same material. So in less sure about what's going to come up. Um, but there's a significant shift. Uh, we always used to say to our students, that if you did really well in licensing, operating and safety and got half the rest right, you'd be OK. But the licensing, operating and safety now has gone from um, it used to be 27 percent of the exam. It's now 22 percent. So there's a five percent difference there. And that, and that can be significant when it comes to a borderline candidate. Um, there's more on electronics and measurement. Um, that's gone up from 26 to 28 uh, percent. And EMC has seen the biggest jump from 13 to 17 percent. And to be fair, if you're going to be operating with 400 watts, EMC is important. So you can understand why that would be. The one that most of the students scream about is there's more potential now for maths questions than there used to be. The most you could get in the old exam was six maths questions because of the way the syllabus was structured. No, I think it's 15 or something like that. So you can get 28% of the exam as a maths exam, which I think is wrong, but that's just you know me. Um, uh, if you're a maths guru, you'd probably think, yeah, bring it on. I'll have 28% marks for doing sums. I could do that. So that, that's a significant change. Um, it's still possible to have only one maths question in the thing because, again, the way the questions are picked. So somewhere between, I think it's one and 15 is, is where you're going to hit. So probably about an average of six or seven. But we've had questions. Some students complaining there wasn't enough maths. Some people saying there was too much maths. And you can't please all the people all the time, as they say. These are the changes. So nothing's been moved into to the full, or nothing significant anyway. It's all new that was never there before. So digital sampling, Fourier transforms, digital modulation, INQ, switchboard power supply block diagrams and, and functions, uh, phase noise in receivers, AGC attack and go. Um, all brand new um, topics. Um, so operating stuff, uh, operating split, um, risk assessments, uh, insurance and doing special event stations and so on. Uh, safety and use of generators, you know, all, all stuff that's probably useful for after the exam. How much of it is useful uh, to, to prove that you can uh, comply with Herrick? Mm, different question, that. But that's where we are. That's what's in there. That's what we're teaching. And um, we'll... Uh, but you can understand that although materials moved out, bringing in this new material means that it, it's not as slim as you might have expected it to be. There are some outstanding issues with the syllabus. So we're at version 1.4. Um, I'll just highlight a few which have been raised with the exam group uh, and they're currently sort of scratching their heads as to what to do about it. The one on the left, um, is a real conundrum uh, that the top bit says you've got to understand the basics of biasing, basically in junction transistors and FETs. And then the note underneath says they'll only use circuits using NPN transistors in a particular configuration. So that's what we've been teaching. And then the people come out the exam and go, we had questions about FETs with circuits and asking us about biasing. You said we weren't going to get that. Sorry, guys, I was just report reporting what was in the syllabus. Um, so I, I suspect that that note shouldn't be there, but I don't know. Um, the one on the right uh, is a, an interesting one that we have to understand the requirements when delegating supervisory responsibilities. Now, as you're probably all aware, you can't super, you can only supervise somebody operating your station if you're in attendance. So you cannot delegate that to anybody. We think the only place you can delegate is in a club station. But if you go to the license, and this is in the licensing section, the word delegate does not appear. Um, you can authorize someone to use the club station and they can therefore supervise people doing that club station. But there's nothing in there about um, what the requirements are for delegating or um, what the delegate, dele delegate has to do. So it's quite tricky to train people how to answer that question um, other than, look, if it's a club station, you're allowed to sort of have other club members who have been authorised and got a full licence to supervise. But 
it'd be nice if they said that, or if they referred to the license clause that uh, that they were thinking about when they wrote that. And this one, I, I queried again very recently, and uh, I cannot get a, a sensible answer on this one. Um, Two-part syllabus thing says, first of all, you need to know the correct procedures when dealing with the MC complaints. We all know that, I think, that you know, you'd be nice to the neighbour who's banging on the door telling you that their TV's exploded. Um, you know, you buy them biscuits, you do some tests, you know, you never admit liability, yada, yada, yada. The second bit says you have to recall the role of Ofcom in cases of undue interference. And I thought I knew the answer to this until somebody said they, they couldn't find the answer. So, of course, you go to the Ofcom website and there are two parts where they talk about interference. One is interference to TV and radio services. And what it says there is Ofcom don't deal with this anymore. Go and talk to the BBC. The other one is about interference to amateur radio. And as anybody that's complained about VDSL will find, they will not investigate um, interference to amateur radio unless it's harmful. And what definition of harmful is risk to life. Well, I, I love my amateur radio, but I cannot say that it's a risk to life uh, that I'm getting VDSL interference. So how do we deal with this syllabus item? Um, on the one hand, the Ofcom is saying they haven't got a role, it's the BBC. And on the other one, the Ofcom role is we're not going to do anything. And the answer from the exam group on this one is, Steve raises an interesting point here. We'll need to have a look at this. In the meantime, people are turning up to exams and are being asked questions about the role of Ofcom that doesn't exist. So I'm a bit cross about that, but that's, they're doing what they, the best they can, I'm sure. So what's my view about all of that? The first one, I think, is that the foundation no longer meets its design criteria. When the foundation was introduced, it was uh, designed as a quick, easy entry to the hobby, something you could complete in a weekend. You didn't have to do it in a weekend, but you could do that if that was the way you wanted to do it. And the focus was on safe, interference-free operating. And I didn't put it on the slide, but using commercial gear is what, what the thing said. Uh, and that was what the Radio Communications Agency press release said. That's what the RSGB said. That's what everybody understood it to be. And it worked. We saw on that graph, 2,000 people in the first year. Uh, it, it, it went crazy. Um, the syllabus review changed all of that. It is now an academic foundation for the two higher levels. I understand the logic of doing that. You know, you get a nice progression in terms of a, an academic throughput. Um, but my fear was, and, and to some degree still is, that this may be seen as too difficult for those who are not 100% committed. Um, you know, the people who say, oh, I wonder what amateur radio is like. I'll give it a try. Um, but when we come to look, have a look at some of the numbers, you may think, oh, you, you, you're worrying unnecessarily there, Steve. Um, come back to that. Intermediate, no question, it's now much harder than it used to be. So Ofcom, I think, have, um, uh, have got their wish in, in, in getting fewer people through or making it harder to get that, that 50 watt license. Um, that should, in theory, make progression to full smoother. If people have got to a higher level at intermediate, it ought to be easier to progress to full. And I think I've got some evidence of that too. But, and it's a big but, if people do not get through the intermediate, they will never get to the full. And there's a, a risk that the harder intermediate will now be perceived as too big a step for a lot of foundation license holders. So it could be that you will never get that throughput. Uh, the ones that do progress will progress smoothly, but you may get fewer people doing it. Wait and see. Um, I also think that the lack of practical assessments will hinder the learning. Uh, I've seen some examples of that through lockdown. Uh, if people are not forced to do it, they won't. It's as simple as that. Um, they will suffer. The learning will suffer as a result of that. My personal view, so I, 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 people got other views, I, I, but I, I, that, I'm, I'm telling you what I think. The full one, um, my concern was it may now be harder to pass. If you've taken the easier bits out and moved them down to intermediate and, and foundation, 
um, and you've brought in some more complex topics you know, the Fourier transforms and, and such like um, and shifted the balance from that safety operating and license to the more technical EMC side of things it could make it harder to pass um, so those were my fears concerns and, and I don't think I was on my own with that um, the, the, we had some good discussions about this in uh, amongst the bath team and that I think was a, was a collective view were we right <laughs> well how is it working let's have a look at the national picture first um, the numbers uh, here I've compared 2018 which was the last full year of um, data that we have because 2019 it, the syllabus changed so I've taken 2018 if you like as the baseline and I've compared that with data from when the new syllabus started up to the end of June this year so that's a 22 month period and there's all sorts of caveats in that not least we had lockdown uh, the exams for intermediate and full weren't available for some of that time but I think over 22 months, if you sort of take a tw condense that into a 12 month average, if you like, um, you're getting something you can compare with 2018. So foundation, um, from a raw numbers point of view, we've seen an increase of 70%. So if you take the 12 month average, um, numbers have gone up by 70%. And the pass rate's gone up. We had 86% passing in 2018 we've had 88% pass in that 22 month period. So that suggests that my fear about people um, shying away from the foundation completely unfounded and people are coming at it in droves. Put my hand up, happy to be proven wrong on that. Um, intermediate, slightly different story. Um, for the, the 12 month average from the 22 months, it's about the same. Now, um, the pass rate, though, has dropped from 93% to 87 So Ofcom have definitely got their wish in that it's harder to pass. Fewer people are getting through that exam than they used to do in, in a, a rate point of view. And then we come to the what was the advanced, now the full. Um, the 22 thing condensed that down shows a 5% reduction. Not a massive uh, difference, but it's a reduction. Uh, but the pass rate's gone up. You know, nationally, it was 61%. It's now gone up to 66%. So um, that suggests that this idea of the smooth progression uh, is working, but we've got fewer people doing it. In terms of progression, um, I think these are some of the starkest numbers. Um, you know, from foundation to intermediate, we had about half, 51% in 2018. The numbers, you know, there was half as many people doing intermediate as there was foundation. So about half were, were, were progressing on average. And that, that you can see that on the graph earlier, it was, it was about half for, for several years. Over this period, that's got dropped to 30%. Uh, and and that, that scares the willies out of me. Um, it, it kind of my fear about intermediate being perceived as a barrier appears to be uh, borne out in those numbers. From intermediate to full, uh, it was 42%, so slightly less than half. Um, it's now 41%, which is you know, about the same. When you look at numbers like this, I, I think that's you know, okay. Um, so what conclusions can we draw? Well, there's been a massive increase in the foundation take up. 70%, I think, uh, you know, that's beyond anybody's wildest dreams and, and very welcome. Um, the pass rate for intermediate is down. Okay, Ofcom are, are happy with that. I have to say, as a, as a, a tutor, I'm not happy, but, you know, hey-ho. Um, and the progression from foundation is down, and, and that is a real worry and something that I think needs to be, uh, needs to be looked at. The key question, of course, hey, this is all caveated, how much of these changes were down to the syllabus and how much of it was down to the pandemic? Um, from what I hear, all sorts of hobbies had massive increase intake during lockdown because people had time on their hands. Apparently the fishing licenses went through the roof. Um, you know, membership of golf courses and things, anything you could do outdoors was, was seen to be, uh, to be good. So I guess some of that increase is down to that, but it's probably going to take another year to two years before we can see what the real picture looks like. So as I say, huge caveats on all those, but that's the picture as it stands 
at the moment. More locally, um, or at least for the Bath Distance Learning, um, we've run one intermediate course and one full course. Uh, the intermediate course, we had 55 people enrolled on it and uh, 36 completed it, uh, which was 65% you know, of those that started actually got to the end and sat the exam. Uh, our pass rate was 94%, um, and the UK uh, average was 87%. So um, very happy that you know, the, the tutor team were performing, that the material was delivering the goods, that we, we got a good result there. Um, and I, I know some of the guys on the call tonight were on that course and uh, uh, will agree it wasn't easy, um, but they, they achieved a fantastic pass rate and, uh, and all the hard work really is down to the, the students uh, as it always is. I can't do a comparison with that because we didn't do intermediate distance learning like that before uh, the, the, uh, under the old syllabus. Our classroom courses, our completion rate was or 99 point whatever percent, I can't remember very many people dropping out. And I certainly never had anybody get to the end and not sit the exam. Um, on this course that we, did, we ran, there were several that got to the end and went, you know, I'm not ready for this. I need another run through. I need to do some more studying. And, and some of them are still studying now. Um, the class pass rate, again, was 99%. It was very rare that we had failures at intermediate. Um, there was one young lad who sat it, I think, five times uh, and eventually passed it. Well, it must have been his lucky day, I guess. Um, and a couple of guys. So over the period of, what, um, 20 years, I think there's been a couple that have failed it, but um, you know, it really is 99.9%. .9%. So, you know, from my personal point of view, the completion rates were down and the pass rates were down, albeit I'm still very happy with 94%. I think that's, you know, that's a good result. The full course, which um, whilst the course is finished, there are still people sitting the exams. Um, uh, if, if Dave's on the course tonight, he's probably glad that we've come towards the end of our uh, bow wave. Um, but uh, here are the numbers. We, we, we started with 140 students, uh, 92 completed the uh, course, 66%. So a similar number to the intermediate in terms of a uh, rate. Uh, the pass rate is currently, I think it's actually 90.86. I put 91 um, uh, in the whole, it might nudge up uh, by this evening, but we haven't had any passes today, so it hasn't. Uh, but again, compared with the UK rate of 66%, I'm very happy with the 91%. I think that shows that, the, the again, the, the, the BBDL, Bath-Based Distance Learning, works. The students uh, put the effort in and they get the results. Um, if we compare that with... 2018, as we did with the national stats, um, that year we had 259 uh, enrolled all the two courses. Um, the completion rate was less, it was 58%. Um, and that was a typical for, for the scheme that we ran it. Um, 55 to 58% was on average at what, what we got. And the pass rate used to be uh, about 80%, or oh, it was in 2018, it was 80%. Over the years, it was 85%. Um, so in terms of the pattern, we've maintained our sort of uh, better than average performance, if you like. Um, if anything, we've improved on it, which is, uh, which is cool. Um, so again, my fears that, um, that the exam was going to get harder, I think, are unfounded. Um, uh, the, 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 the students have proved me wrong and um, the, the, they've done a grand job. Scoring was, we'll see what the second one looks like. You know, it, it may it may get a different result on the second course, but uh, uh, at the moment that's looking pretty good, I have to say, and I'm very pleased with that. Um, I think we had our 80th pass this week uh, off the course, which I, I think is, is pretty good. This is a more difficult one to answer. Are the steps more even? In terms of material, I think they are. Um, you know, the, the, the foundation was deliberately a quick get it in, get your license, move on. Um, that's longer. Uh, the intermediate's longer, the full is shorter. So in terms of the volume of material, yes, I think the steps are more even. Um, but the, 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 the downside of that, if you like, is the, the new foundation is a higher entry step, but it doesn't seem to have affected the numbers. So, you know, get back in your box, Steve. Um, the new intermediate 
is a higher step, and that appears to be slowing down the progression rate and lowering the pass rate. The full is still seen as a big step, but the evidence certainly from our course is that people are doing just as well in that one as they did with the old one. So how will it look post-COVID? Come back next year and tell me. <laughs> All of that has generated a new problem, though. Um, I'm not sure that we, we foresaw this when we started, but we've certainly seen evidence of it now. Um, people who passed the intermediate before September last year or indeed, there was a period between September and November where they could do reset. So, but anybody that passed under the old syllabus has missed out on some of the basics that used to be in the advanced, but are now in the intermediate. And it's a bit like trying to do a jigsaw with the frame missing. If you, if you don't know where things fit, it, it can be sort of disorientating. It's an even bigger issue for those who passed the old City and Guilds novice exam. Uh, because they, I thought they even did AC, so that the, there's a massive difference. Um, so how do we resolve that? I, I, there are two thoughts. One is that before we take anybody on a full course who did the old one, we insist on them doing the intermediate course again. It's obviously not very popular. Um, or there's a thought that there's a need for a bridging course. And the same applies to foundation to some degree, but perhaps to a lesser degree. But to help people make that transition from the old syllabus to the new. Um, and as a, we've got people doing the course now that passed uh, the intermediate 15 years ago. Th this need could go on for quite some time. Uh, we may even be on a completely another syllabus again. So that needs to be borne in mind, I think, before we make any radical changes to the syllabus. That what, well, how does it affect people that fall between the two stools? And um, I don't know the answer to that at this stage. I'm just saying we've identified it as a problem. What does the future hold? So get your crystal balls out. Um, the three-tier syllabus, version 1.4 at the moment, is under review. And it actually says in the, uh, the, the syllabus itself that uh, version two uh, is expected to be out for consultation in January 2021. I guess like a lot of things in lockdown, that's been pushed back. But I haven't seen any documentation or any announcements to when that's going to appear. But we can expect a version two of the syllabus sometime this year, I guess. It's likely that we'll have more stuff about EMF assessment because it's on everybody's uh, discussion boards at the moment. Um, our hope is that that will clear up some of those issues that I flagged earlier. Um, uh, and there are others that uh, I, I won't bore you with. Um, what we hope also is there's not going to be significant changes where we've got to rip up all our training material and start all over again. Because I have to say, if we go through that exercise again, I think it really will go in the bin. The one that worries me uh, is there's a proposal to have more regular updates in the syllabus rather than wait. 10 years or whatever, and, and then do a massive change, that the idea is you can do little changes incrementally. There's nothing been published on how regular those changes will be, um, but I think it's a really bad idea. I know others think it's a bad idea because every time you make that little change, it can actually have a massive impact on people that write the books, people that write questions, people who deliver training and poor old students who might be learning from a book they bought six months ago who suddenly there's a bit missing. So my personal view is that they shouldn't do syllabus changes any more regularly than three years. But you know, that other people have got different ideas, I know. If you've got something that's been uh, imposed, like Ofcom introducing the new license for EMF, you can't do a lot about that. You're going to have to deal with that. Uh, but if all we want to do is tinker around and, and generate change for change's sake, I think you've got to think long and hard, is it really worth it? The other proposal which is on the slot chit is the idea of a single exam that will take you from zero to, to a full license in, in one step. Um, we did see a draft syllabus for that back in March. Uh, and the aim of that is to have a parallel route so that if you've got somebody who's already competent, you know, an RF engineer or a graduate in sort of well, uh, engineering, electrical engineering, something like that, who can walk into the exam probably and give it a good stab. 
they, they shouldn't have to go through three levels. Uh, and I've been an advocate of that for you know, a very long time. Um, and no, it's possible to do it. I think it's a great idea. Um, I don't think it's for everybody because we saw on that graph what happened when we had one RAE exam before, you know, it, it, it was in terminal decline. So I, I don't think it's, it's for everybody. The results of the consultation haven't been published yet, so I've got no idea where that's headed. Um, but we did a mock exam where we, based on the syllabus that was uh, consulted on, we put a mock exam together. It just happened that I had a bunch of people waiting to get onto our full course and uh, over 100 of them had a go at that mock exam. And they, not me, they found it too easy to pass. Um, I think 80% of them passed it, and uh, some of them with very good marks. Um, and they themselves said they felt cheated, but it was just too easy to pass, and they, they weren't happy with it. Um, the one thing I found in putting it together, that it's extremely variable in, in, in the level of difficulty. Um, you, you could end up with an exam that had got three full-level questions, or 23. Um, so two, two people sit in the same exam two days apart would get a very different experience. And that can't be right, that's not credible. So we made some recommendations on how to resolve it. I've heard nothing further, so watch this space. The only thing I did see, uh, Tony Kent, who's the exam standards uh, chairman, was on the ICQ podcast, and you, you can find that and, and listen to it yourself. And he said, this wasn't a quick project. Um, you've got to get this syllabus agreed. Once it's agreed, you've got to give six or 12 months notice to set exams. So you know, you're looking late next year at the earliest, I think, before that can uh, see the light of day, unless something remarkable happens. But um, the, the, the vibes I'm picking up is that this is not something that's going to happen anytime soon. So if you're waiting to do the director full, you've got a long wait, I think. What does the future hold for us in Bath? Well, we're currently loading our next full course. It was advertised in Radcom and um, on GB2RS and, and various other platforms. Um, I've had loads of applications. Uh, it looks like the course is going to be full again. Uh, the closing date is next week, 4th of August. Um, what we've introduced is a thing called the pre-course classroom. Um, and that is where um, students get to do some of the old so the, the new intermediate stuff. So in theory, they should know it because they're going to go into the full. Um, so they do watch some videos, they read some material, uh, and then there's a 20 question quiz at the end of it to see if they've uh, taken it in. The main reason for doing that is to check they can use the system. Um, but also it's an, an element for them to know, do, do they know the basic stuff? Can they actually absorb material and, and, and do the work? We've done that for the intermediate and the full course that we've run, and we think that's why we've improved retention, because people have been through a bit of pre-course preparation, uh, and a few have said, Oof, I'm not ready for this, I'm going to go away and do some revision, which is fine, I think that's, that's helpful. Um, so that, that's going to keep us busy from the end of August to Christmas. Um, so Dave uh, and, and the online invigilators, or maybe by then classroom exams, who knows, We'll be, um, uh, we'll be getting another maybe 80, 90 folk doing exams before or after Christmas. And if people are waiting for intermediate, our next course will be January next year uh, when we do that all again. As far as the classroom course goes, you can see there, there's the empty classroom. We've got no idea when we can get back in there. We don't know what the demand is going to be like locally. I haven't had a single request for a foundation course. I think everybody's going to see Pete in, in Essex. Um, will the exams come back in the classroom? Don't know, wait and see. Um, I have to say, having had the experience of running the distance learning courses with tutorials through COVID, um, is that a better use of our time? You know, we're getting bigger numbers through. Um, we're not servicing the local community quite so much, but uh, my, my inclination is to think you know, we may be better doing the uh, the distance learning, it, it's certainly a better return on our investment of time. We have got vague plans for a Bath Build-a-thon around about Christmas, depending on how things are. Uh, and we're thinking that might be an inter-club event because we haven't got any intermediate students who used to be our mainstay. Uh, we might involve clubs from the Wessex 
broad Wessex area to uh, to come and have a build-a-thon event. Um, but um, Lewis and I were, were chewing the fat on that last week, so uh, we'll, uh, we'll probably have another discussion at the weekend and see where that takes us. So, I was aiming to finish at nine o'clock, and yeah, we're there. Um, hopefully, I've answered those questions. So we know where we are, we know where we've come from, we know how different it is, looked at how well it's working, and had a gander at what the future might hold. Uh, so our final slide is, are there any questions? So I'll stop sharing my screen at that point and uh, see what people have got to say. John, back to you as chair, if, uh, if you like. Okay. Okay. <coughs> I don't have any questions. Uh, anybody else? Yeah, can I can I go, John, please? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, yeah, um, I'm Jeff, G4FKA, north of Bristol in Corpett Heath. Um, yeah, as someone who did their exam in 1972, the old the old style exam, and I can see from the call signs here there are people who, who probably did it in the 60s, so they can be in a similar position. Um, I was sort of comparing thoughts of, of the process I went through, you know, 40 odd years ago, however long that was, getting on for 50 years, um, with what's there today. And I just had a few observations, really, just to see what, what people think. Uh, and obviously, the people who've done the, the newer licenses will probably be able to help. Um, first point I, I wrote down here was the, uh, the 1981 blip, Steve, that you mentioned, and you thought, well, was it or was it not CB? Um, well, I can assure you it was. At the time, uh, I was a member of the Stevenage Club up in Hertfordshire. Um, and when CB became legal in 1981, the Stevenage Club, there were a lot of um, people in that general area who had been involved in CB uh, sort of, you know, prior to it becoming legal. We had dozens of people come across into the Stevenage Club at that particular time and, and immediately did the exams. Uh, and, and got, you know, G6 calls that we had at the time. And then quite a few of them went on to get G4s as well. The club went in that particular time to the highest level of membership that it has ever had in its 60 <clears throat> odd year existence. And that was purely due to dozens of people moving across who were a little bit disenchanted with the number of people that were coming on, on the limited number of channels, you know, the 40 channel CD boxes. So yeah, just to add a bit of uh, practical experience to that uh, chart, Steve. Yes, definitely dozens in the, in the case of the Stevenage Club. Um, I think I was a bit, I, I had some positive comments, particularly on that intermediate syllabus. It does seem very broad, the new syllabus. I was, I was very encouraged by its breadth. In fact, there were some topics, having done an electronic engineering degree at university, um, there were some topics there that I wouldn't have expected to have covered until, until that degree thinking back to the degree I did, um, albeit in my case, long after I did the, the RAE. Um, the information sheets, perhaps I wasn't so keen on. I mean, I think if I go back to a typical question that I would have done in, in a 1972 exam, um, you know, you would be asked to something like state Ohm's law or state something else's theory, and then you would go into the detail of, of you know, the question, calculations, whatever, whatever it was. So I'm just wondering if that element of it has sort of gone in that, Back in the original RAE days, you would have sort of stated the theory or stated the principle and then gone on to describe how you solve, you know, the equation or the or the circuit that, that was there in front of you. Um, Boring. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Um, so that and, and that typically would have been a sort of a university question as well. Um, so, yeah, I wasn't so so perhaps keen on that. Um, I think the breadth of there, I think the one thing that I was a bit surprised had gone all together was valves. Yes, SDR, uh, direct sampling and hybrids of those are very much the way all, all new equipment is going. Uh, and my little 7610 here next to me is, is a prime example of that. But there are still quite a few va uh, valve amplifiers around that do use valves. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot, of, a lot of people who got 8877s in you know, single tube amps for various, for various bands. So whilst... Yeah, I think it's appropriate that we go to that new technology because it is very much the way that the commercial equipment is going. Um, there are there are there is still a role for valves, and actually to be able to describe a valve 
is actually quite a good way. Of, there is there are direct analogies with the way various types of solid state device work as well. So I think having that sort of comparison in the way that the basic um, devices work is, is very good. But yeah, that was a, a very, very interesting history there, Red Steve. Thank you very much for that. Super. Well, on, on, just picking up on the information sheets, um, um, that really came about when Mike Coombs, um, G3 VTO, was doing the classes with us. He was doing an open university degree uh, module on RF design, I think it was. And he brought in his uh, information sheet that was held, used at the open university level. And he said, how is it that we expect young radio amateurs to remember all these formula and yet at degree level, they're given it? And, I, and we, we put a case to what was then, I think, the RCF exam committee to say, you know, here's evidence that university students have been given the formula, but you're expecting these newcomers to, to remember all this. This, you know, this can't be right. And, you know, that was, a, to me, a great improvement. But it, 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 it took that, um, you know, you've still got to apply it in the right circumstances. And you've got to recognise which one is for Q and which one's for residence and which ones when you know so there's you still got to understand what's there or at least recognize it um and looking up things on the band plan is what you do in real life so i, I you know I, i'm a fan of those so you know know my colors to the mast but i what you said before i, I can't disagree with that you know i think valve amplifiers you know if you particularly at full level you're going to do a 400 watt ticket in effect you may well get a valve amplifier to, to, to use that and, and not to have covered it seems remiss, but I didn't write the syllabus, so uh, I'm just telling you where it is. <laughs> I guess it was a case of if you bring new stuff in, you have to shove something out and, and that was probably the, the easiest candidate. Mm. Any other questions? God, it's all very quiet. <laughs> if, I'm, if I may, Steve, um... What's your view on changing? I mean, we're already we're already using reference booklets and, and formula sheets. Why don't we just go the whole hog and say it's an open book exam? We are we are at the end of the day at, 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 um, promoting a hobby, not a profession. I, I'd be quite happy with an open book exam. Um, my my concern, though, having done open book exams, um, they're bloody hard. Um, that I, I did one for. Uh, project management and it was the hardest exam I've ever done because you had the book they expected you to get chapter and verse absolutely spot on answers um, and it took a long time to find the bit in the manual even with flags to, to know where to look so it's a two-edged sword um, I, I, but having reference material I don't have a problem with because say in real life no, who, who remembers the uh, the license schedule and you know where the calling frequencies are and, and centers of activity and all that you don't do you? you look them up so i think that's a real life test um i, I, I agree i mean you know speaking professionally i mean I, I i use design standards and things every day although every day i don't remember those design standards i just go and pull them off of the off of the uh, web throughout through our server system and get the latest version of it and reread it every time yeah yeah so i yeah i i don't think there'd be any harm in having an open book exam um, I suspect that the exam committee would have a very different view on that based on my interactions with them in the past. Well, I, I have raised it a couple of times on the tutors' forum and been shot down in flames for it. So, <laughs> Dave's got his hand up there. Go on, Dave. Well, it, it is a subject that has been discussed. Uh, it's been mentioned by Tony a few times, I think, uh, and and Mike Bruce, open book. But I think the problem is, you know, whilst you know there's difficulty in writing questions. For, uh, for the current exams, trying to write questions for an open book exam would be even harder. And as you say, you know, the, the level of competence that you'd have to show would go up, you know, would, would be ramped up significantly. It's, it's like a lot of these things. There's no, there's no right answer and there's no wrong answer to any of this, you know, because we're trying to, we're trying to cover, you know, any, anybody in society you know, from from people, you know, who, you know, I don't want to decry professions or anything like that, you know, but, you know, from, from brain surgeons to bin men and that sort of thing. And that's what you find. You know. I usually use the analogy of the, the butcher, the baker and the candlestick maker, because that's non-controversial. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can be controversial at times, yes. <laughs> um, I mean, just, just picking up on, on the point, that in my professional work, 
um, if, if, if today and tomorrow, I'm marking some open book exams. Um, and uh, the way that one works is you're given a question paper and you have 24 hours to answer it. And you can use the internet, you can use whatever sources you like to be able to answer that. But the answers that you're expected to produce are pretty high level and um, people are falling down because they're trying to do it from memory or they leave it until 10 to midnight and they, they just bash out a quick answer and they fail miserably. Um, you would expect, you think, well, it's an open book exam. Everybody's going to pass. Don't work like that. Um, so it, as, as Dave said, it's not a... It's not an easy. It's an easy question. It's a hard one to answer. I think. Oh, I, I, absolutely. I, I, I fully expect that. And I, and I wasn't suggesting that we move, we move to a twenty four hour exam exam window and uh, expect mm. people to to to, uh, to 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 look everything up in a thousand places. I mean, you know, there, there is a limited amount of sort of, of resource material that would be applicable at a foundation level in particular. Um, you know, why do you need to rem even remember V over I R? Uh, oh, you don't on, your, on, your, on your triangle let's be honest about it it's it's um you know if you if you if you know if you know that ohm's law exists and you know that when you get an ohm's law question you've got to look the formula up in the book on page 27 where's the where's the harm yeah, i agree with you i agree with you. dave whilst you're on have you, have you any update on if classroom exams are coming back or practicals or any any of the questions that I couldn't answer? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're all burning questions at the moment. I mean, the statement that we've made is that, you know, as and when restrictions are lifted, then, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll review it. And, you know, um, there's still, you know, doubting in a lot of people's minds about, you know, clubs meeting and stuff like that. I mean, you know, some clubs have decided... You know, they've they've managed to over the last 15 months, they've managed to meet very successfully via this sort of medium. So why do we need to bother and, and hire a room and sit around and discuss ingrowing toenails and things like that? You know? <laughs> <laughs> At least here you can sort of concentrate on, you know, amateur radio matters. You know, it, it's it's less. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's more difficult to drift off to to non amateur amateur topics, if you like, you know that sort of thing. Mm. But uh, it's it's constantly under review, you know. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> but what we have noticed, and I, and I think it's a holiday thing, is that uh, uh, the, the the numbers um, have slowed down, uh, particularly in August, with candidates mm -hmm. booking exams. Um, and yeah, we've seen we've seen the big big rise in your um, your full candidates, Steve, yeah, and that they're, they're all doing extremely well. You know, I think I've only found one who's who's failed at the moment. I've only invigilated one of them who's failed. I, I don't like to give the number of fails. I say so it's a ninety one percent pass rate. And that's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> we've had eighty passes. So if you're good at maths, you can work that back. Yeah, that's that's it. Right. But that was it. That was one of the things I can always remember from years gone by. We were going to a rally at York and we were listening in on a repeater and there was they were talking about the old um, you know essay exams and it was inferred that nobody ever failed the essay the, the, the written exam ah. you know? but somebody yeah. did come on and say oh, I failed it twice he said <laughs> <laughs> he was the one <laughs> yeah you know, no, that's I, I mean when when people do comparison I, I was it's very difficult to compare. With, you know, was that easy or that harder? Because there were different times. You mm. know that, that you know, now we've got to deal with things like Nyquist rates and things. Whereas you know, in 1960, it was fairly basic technology and, and relatively easy to understand. You know, yeah. so you can't compare one with other. But I know there are lots of people out there who bang the drum and say we should go back to the RAE. You think, well, which one? <laughs> <laughs> Multi-choice one paper, multi-choice two paper, the, uh, the the essay eight from ten or the essay eight. You know, which, which one are you talking about? And and quite often they don't realise there's been more than one. You know, there was only the one that they did. Yeah, that's uh, right. Um, yeah. And, and like you know, it's the old grass is always greener on the other side. Um, I, I think we've got a system and it works, and you know, the, it, we've got to try and make the best of it. So. Yeah. Yeah. Rose-coloured, real-looking. Um... Uh, mirrors or glasses. Say again, Peter. Uh, Rose-coloured, rearward-looking uh, mirrors or glasses. <laughs> <laughs> With smoke and mirrors. <laughs> uh, 
I think I think the other thing that's impacting classroom type work as well is the fact. Certainly, I think I think most radio clubs we are beholden on you know the organisers and managers of the venues that we meet at being a completely different set of people. Yeah. Certainly in the Bristol area, you know, we've got community centres and church halls and the, the Barwa Sports and Social Centre at Filton. And um, none of those organisations are owned or managed by us. Right. And they're all taking a different approach to the rate at which they come out of lockdown, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, you, you Dave or somebody could say, yeah, here's the principle that we're going to put out, you know, but it's just not going to be practical yeah. because the, the, organi- the organisers of the, of the buildings are taking different view. Yeah. No, you're right. We're just going to wait and see what happens. And, yeah. And, oh, and I think we're we're all sort of of a certain age, or certainly on this call, where you know we've got a, perhaps a different view to somebody who might be 25, 30 years of age. Mm-hmm. You know, we. I mean, I'm I'm very interested to see how um, how rallies perform. Mm-hmm. You know, would you want to go to a rally and start picking up bits of kit? You know that somebody else has picked up five minutes ago. And you, you know, um, okay, we used to do it in the past, but you know, there wasn't COVID in the past. Now, with uh, cleaning and you know, hygiene and stuff like that, would you would you want to be in that sort of environment? I, I'm not sure. I mean, I I'm interested because I, I organised the Blackburn rally, you know, and we made a conscious decision, you know, certainly not even to contemplate this year, and you know. Uh, I have to do it on the prom instead of in the hotel. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, in, the, in this area, we'll find out in four days' time because of the Chippenham Club rally. Yeah. But yeah. that's an all open, 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 you know, in fields and, and, and the village green. Yeah. But yes, I think everybody be taking along rubber gloves so they can pick up the items. Mm. It'll be very, very interesting, Jeff. Yeah. It'll be very interesting. Cool. Well, look, guys, it's gone nine o'clock. If, uh, yeah. If there are any burning questions, I'll take one more. But other than that, I think I need to pull the plug and feed this cat. So he's going back. <laughs> well, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Steve very much for uh, coming in to do this talk for us tonight. And um, yeah, maybe you could give us a, give a bit of a round of applause, please. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. No, for, for no. me. I- so I, I did the um, the foundation second, last. Yes, Dave. Yeah. John, John, could you stop the recording? <laughs> oh, oh, yes. Yeah. Recording stopped. Cool. <laughs> there we go. Um, oh, like everyone hmm. Okay. Brilliant stuff. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, for, for me, I did the um, the uh, foundation course last year in May with Essex Ham. Then I took the intermediate in September with the OARC club and the GM6 on the, the internet. And then I did the full with Steve, you know, and passed in June, you know. So for me, it's just been a year from from the foundation, you know, to the to the full, you know. And the thing I had to learn was the scientific calculator. Because that was, you know, you know, I'd never really used the scientific calculator. So that was a big obstacle as well, was learning how to use the scientific cal- calculator. Mm. Yeah. And I've seen that a lot in um our own students, um, there's not everybody that's uh, used to them. And of course, I'm used to using one of the Hewlett Packard ones with a, um, a reverse Polish notation. So um, I find it very difficult to teach anybody, anybody, anything else. Yeah, because for me, the calculator came in after I left school. So <laughs> I, was, I was taught the slide rule at school. <laughs> no, it's, it's the same. It's got a battery in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how did what, um, Mark, what in particular helped you to grasp the scientific calculator? Well, there was the, um, I forget the name, uh, there was a, a big, uh, you could download uh, uh, 
all the like the formulas and how to put it into the Casio ca calculator uh -huh. without, without digging the uh, I, 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 I downloaded it off the internet from I forget his name uh, but uh, he showed you each of the formulas and how mm -hmm. to input the the keys and that's how I I learned it. And 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 for Steve, he was saying you you don't have, you don't have to re rearrange the formula. If you put the answers, because you get four answers mm. into the formula, you can see on the three oh nine, you can work it out instead of trying to re rearrange the formula. It was an easier way. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. I'll um, remember that tactic. We've um... Uh, I run a help on a course uh, here, and uh, we seem to get uh, anything between one and four on each course, but um, are not, or in fact, are scared stiff of um, any form of calculator. So we have George, to do a bit of extra training for them. George Smart has got a couple of videos, and I think mm. he's got a, a, a booklet. And there's a guy in Wales, I can't remember his call sign. Around around the Chester area, who's got a similar sort of thing. Hmm. But I, uh, I I've not seen it where it goes down to the level that, that you described, Mark. Where I'll go and dig it out. Way. I've got it. I'll just it's just in the next next room. I'll dig it out. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, I think actually I've seen it um, referred to certainly. But, um... You see, you see the the thing about the calculations is that. Um, the, then we're not after precision. What mm. you will find, what, what you won't find is where, okay, the correct answer is 4.1 and you've got 4 or 4.3, you know. Mm. Yeah. You'll find that, you know, 4.1 is the answer, yes, but the alternative answer is 3, 7 and, and 8 mm. or something like that. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So it's not after precision, it's just after no. Actually, proven you can you recognise the you formula and can yeah. use it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Same situation. Yeah. yeah. It's UK full license mass, and it's Keith. Yeah. Really. That's it. Yeah, Keith. Yeah. yeah, that's it. Yeah. I found that very use use useful. Now you know. Ah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'll uh, look at do a search for that. And, and the right. other thing you find, you often find, is that uh, whilst there might appear to be a maths question, if you can, if you understand though the subject, you can, you don't have to use any maths at all. You know, you know it can't be. It's like the you know parallel resistors. Yeah, yeah I oh. had two of those this year, and it's uh, uh, hmm. not yeah. many people um, realise that one. Hmm. Yeah, and, and, and is that a trick? Or, you know, because a lot of people say you, you can learn things by these little tricks, you know, mm. Biv and all the rest of it, very, yeah. VIR, very important rule, mm. power in the kitchen, you know, poison ivy and that sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But if you understand things, then, you know, uh, I, I think, you know, you, you don't well, quite often. You don't the real know. task behind the, for the instructors is to... Uh, to lead the uh, students into an understanding of what they're trying to put in and get out at the end. Yeah, yeah. And they work through it with them. Sometimes it takes a long time. Sometimes it goes just like that. And I can see, I can see where that's that's a challenge when you've got an, a, like an audience like we've got now, where what are there's about eighteen on here now, uh -huh. and all different levels of uh, you know understanding. Oh yeah. yeah. How how do you cater for the for the strong guy, and how do you cater for the weak guy? You know, mm. you, you, you can't drag them off to the side. You know, in the in not, the not on a um, uh, video conference, but you could, you could in a classroom. Yeah, yeah. That, that's the difference. Yeah, yeah. Because what Steve did, he would do the the main video chat, and then you each had individual tutors, so he split us up into like groups yeah. of 30 mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. different tutors. So if you were struggling with something, you could ask your tutor and he would show you, you know, how to how to, 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 to do it. Mm. Oh, you do it using the rooms function, yeah? Yeah, very good. 
yeah. I know that that's a technique we used to use right at the very early days of foundation. We had large classes. Our first class at foundation level back in 2002 was 40 people. Oh, and what we used to do was do a central presentation, you uh, know, chalk and talk, you know, death by PowerPoint, whatever you want to call it, mm. but then split everybody off into small groups, four or five, yeah. and allocate a tutor to them. And then they'd, they'd have 10 minutes afterwards going over that particular topic, you know, mm. and they get to know each other. Because, again, in a classroom environment, in a Zoom environment, people are, you know, shy. I mean, you know, you know, they don't like to ask questions. I mean, we, you tell people there's no such thing as a daft question, but some people are very, very nervous about putting questions for. Yes. Um, yeah. But if every you, you know, every year I have a little. Bit. Every year I have a little tirade. Come on, let's have a question. That's, no yeah. question. <laughs> yeah, uh, and you often get the smart ass who knows. Excuse my friends who knows it all. You know, who answers every question, puts his hand up. You know, and you tell him, hang on. Shut up, sit on your hand or whatever. <laughs> Let somebody else have a go. Yeah. 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 Good stuff. Is there anything else you, you remember from the course that was particularly um, significant, Mark? Um, Negative or positive? Yeah, you know, I, there's no way I could have passed it without, you know, Steve's course. Because, hmm. uh, you know, I tried to read it from the book and I did like a read through with the full with the OARC site, they did like a read through, but it was nowhere near as what I need, what I got from Steve. Hmm. You know, he he, he, he he explained it very, very well going through the different uh, sub, sub subjects, but the math side though, you just couldn't use like one formula to answer the question because you might have to use four different formulas <laughs> to answer one mass question, you know what I mean? It, was, oh. it wasn't it was easy. Oh, well, next year you can go on and take a university course. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, in, in certain ways, you're up to that level now, <laughs> in certain areas. But I found, you know, it was learning. You know, Steve would drum into you the license conditions, you know, mm. the safety. You know, and that, so if you wasn't very good at maths, you could sort of just scrape through doing those those subjects, you know, because mm -hmm. like what Steve said, you know, they are all in that, you know, the EX309, you know, so, you know, if you, if you throw away marks, which are in that booklet, you know, it's best to get all them right and you're sort of halfway there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. The other thing about, you know, uh, re remote learning is that it comes at you regularly, and you've got to you've got to be very disciplined. Mm, you know, yeah. you need what is it two hours for for the for, you know, for an evening presentation? Then you've got a couple of hours work, homework, whatever you want to call mm. it. And if you miss it, you know, then it really backs up on you. You know, mm. and you really struggle. So you've got to be very very disciplined about it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's one thing. Uh, hmm. right. Dave, that um, bit about shyness, we haven't had many other people ask questions tonight either. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, yeah. Anyway, nice to speak to you again. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to go and... Uh, yeah. I'll, I'm, I'm going to disappear as well, guys. Yeah. Cheers. Yeah, thank all you. For all the uh, company. Yeah. yeah. All right. right. I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. very Thanks yeah, good. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye. 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 Good. Night. Bye. Good night. Bye. Good night.